It calls itself Australia's favourite airline, but try telling that to the thousands of customers who've had flights cancelled and no refunds. In battled airline, Qantas is again in chaos today without going... Oh, how quickly an airline can fall from grace. Qantas has almost overnight gone from an internationally recognised and respected brand to one of a greedy corporation that has angered tens of thousands of its own customers as well as millions more in its home country and beyond. And why was that? Stay tuned. In many of these videos I'd like to give you a bit of history and context before I dive into the main topic. And in this case, that context is especially important. You see, this isn't a story of just another random corporation who did something questionable annoying a big bunch of its customers. Now to appreciate why the Qantas scandal enraged so many people in Australia, you really need to understand what this company means to the lovely people who live there. First of all, Qantas is actually an acronym. It stands for Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Services, which was the name that the airline used when it started its operation in November of 1922. Yeah, you heard that right. Qantas has already celebrated its 100th birthday. Now, the airline was actually founded a couple of years before that, in 1920, initially performing demonstration flights and some ad hoc charters with a two-seat Avro 504K biplane. But it was in 1922 that their regular mail and passenger services started initially with just two aircraft. Qantas pride themselves on being the oldest continuously operating airline in the world, but if that's accurate, depends on who you ask, and I'll get back to that shortly. The airline's 1920 start came just after the end of the First World War, which wasn't a coincidence. It was actually started by two former World War I veterans called Paul McGuinness and Hudson Fish, uh, together with the company's first chairman, Fergus McMaster. With the Great War still very fresh on everyone's minds, the airline founders declared that their new company was inspired by the spirit of ANZAC, which was the name that was used to refer to Australian and New Zealand troops during the war. Now, as the Queensland and Northern Territory bit of their name suggests, that's where the airline was started, and it quickly proved to be a great and fast way for people to get about, which therefore also got really popular. Soon, those who could afford it not only started traveling by air, but also bought shares in this new company as a way to kind of support it further. And that was an early indicator of just how positively Australians would embrace it. In 1935, Qantas then flew its first scheduled flight abroad to Singapore using a de Havilland DH-86. At the same time, the company was also preparing a flying boat service to enable connection between Australia and the United Kingdom, which was quite a big ask for that era. That service then started in 1938, using multiple stops with Qantas flying the legs from Sydney over to Singapore, where British Imperial Airways took over, bringing the passengers the rest of the way to Southampton in the United Kingdom. But then came the Second World War, and unsurprisingly, several Qantas aircraft were called into military service, as well as many of their crews, but not all of them. Qantas actually continued operating their domestic flights, and for the first couple of years of the war, they even continued their service over to Singapore. Now, because they had a pool of commercial pilots available at that time, it also meant that they were sometimes given one-off military tasks, like ferrying new aircraft over from the United States. And on top of that, some Qantas flying boats were also used to help evacuating both civilians and service personnel from various hotspots during the war. That wartime service is why Qantas can add the continuously operating qualifier when they claim to be the oldest continuously operating airline in the world. Because technically, KLM is about one year older than them, but unlike Qantas, they temporarily stopped operations during the Second World War. Now, there was also a Colombian airline that evolved into today's Avianca, which was also founded a bit before Qantas, but they didn't operate continuously either. Now, like I mentioned before, not everyone agrees with Qantas' assertion being the oldest one, though. Some people argue that KLM actually continued operating in some Dutch colonies, like the Caribbean, for example, but I don't know. I think I'm going to let the Dutch and the Aussies sort this out in the comments below, so 
get at it. And while you're down there, please like and subscribe as well. In any case, at the end of the war, Qantas immediately restarted their international flights. And up until this point in its history, the airline had still remained a privately owned company. But that all changed in 1947. You see, the Qantas aircraft fleet was by that time getting quite old, and the financial uncertainties of the post-war era had meant that the airline just didn't have enough money to upgrade to new aircraft. So in 1947, Qantas went under federal government ownership and soon acquired some nice new Lockheed Constellations, Convair 240s, and eventually also Super Constellations, who enabled commercial flights over to the United States for the very first time. Qantas then entered the jet age in 1959 when they became the first airline outside of the United States to put the mighty Boeing 707 into service. And their first 747 then arrived in 1971, with the airline constantly expanding its operations both domestically and abroad. Then, in 1995, Qantas was once again privatized, becoming one of the founding members of the One World Alliance in 1998, but before that, in 1987, they had also added another key milestone, their first frequent flyer program. So why was that so important then? Other airlines like United had introduced these kind of frequent flyer programs already back in the 1970s. But what makes Qantas frequent flyer program stand out is that it was just insanely popular. Today, Australia has an estimated population of around 27.3 million people, and Qantas' frequent flyer program has 16.4 million members, equivalent to about 60% of the country's entire population. Now, the actual percentage is probably a little bit lower, since this also includes foreign members, but why is the majority of Australians joining this program, and why does it matter? Well, one of the reasons is likely a feeling of knowing what you're getting, a feeling of safety. And while we're on that topic, how are you feeling regarding your online safety, specifically your privacy? Did you know that your personal data is likely being sold right now by several different data brokers? It's being sold to banks, insurance companies, and even cyber criminals, anyone who's really willing to pay for it. But don't worry, there is a way to stop that. Let me introduce today's sponsor, Delete Me, a service designated to help you remove your personal data from the web. Now you might wonder why this even matters, so let me share a story with you. A few weeks ago, Dominic, my awesome editor for Mentor Pilot, found out that his personal information was scattered over loads of different data broker websites. This included his address, social media profiles, passwords, and even details about his family. So he decided to deploy Delete Me. Since signing up, Dominic has watched Delete Me wash his info away from dozens of sites, so he can now continue just focusing on his work, knowing that his privacy is being thoroughly protected. So are you ready to take back control of your online privacy? Well, in that case, you can get 20% off Delete Me's US consumer plans when you go to joindeleteme.com slash mentornow with the code mentornow. Thank you, Delete Me. Now, why are so many Australians members of the Qantas Frequent Flyer program? Well, the popularity becomes much easier to understand when you take a good look at Australia as a country. Size-wise, Australia is only about 5% smaller in area than the lower 48 American states. But like I said earlier, Australia's population is only around 27.3 million people, not even one-tenth that of the United States. Now, in the case of the United States, it is customary to say that the country's population is more densely concentrated near its coastlines, and the same is true for Australia as well, but to a much more extreme extent. There are, of course, some exceptions to this, but it's fair to say that the country's population is overwhelmingly concentrated at or near the coastline. For example, Canberra, Australia's capital, is considered to be an inland city because it's just over 110 kilometers or 68 miles away from the coastline. But if you look at its location on a map, it doesn't look that much inland to me. The point I'm trying to make with all of this is that about two thirds of Australians live in urban areas and most of the rest aren't too far away from the coast either. So moving around this country means covering some vast distances and flying is a big part of making that possible. 
And that's only talking about domestic travel. When going abroad, Australians also want good access to destinations in, for example, Europe and North America, which isn't easy considering the enormous distances involved. So knowing that, having their own robust and healthy national airline with the right aircraft fleet and capacity for these far-flung destinations is just really, really important for Australians. And it's almost equally important that this airline can offer enough tickets at the right price and that the pricing is worth keeping in mind for what's about to come. When you combine all of these factors, you can see that Qantas today isn't just a part of Australia's identity outside the country. Nope, it's a flag carrier that matters way more to its country's people than the typical ceremonial value that most other flag carriers have. And that is something you need to keep in mind as we now start digging into the variety of things that the management of Qantas has done lately. And yes, we're not talking about one single thing. There are several. At this point, we also have to introduce a specific character in this story, former Qantas CEO Alan Joyce. Joyce ran the company for nearly 15 years, having risen through its ranks before finally taking over at the helm as CEO. His journey in the airline world started with Aer Lingus in his native country of Ireland, where he worked from 1988 to 1996. He then moved down under and took up a position with Ansett Australia, but moved on to Qantas only about four years later. There he then moved upwards and finally became the CEO in 2008, which, as I'm sure many of you remember, wasn't a very easy year for the airline industry, or really any other industry for that matter. The financial meltdown in 2008 inevitably also affected Qantas, with the first job cuts and other tough measures coming in 2011. Joyce, the boss of Qantas, says those redundancies will be across the board, including pilots, management and engineers. And then in 2012, the airline also reported its first full year financial loss since going private about 17 years earlier. It's going to be a lot of hard work, a lot of initiatives like the initiatives that we've made to get that business back to profit. Now, obviously, CEOs don't get very popular when they go around cutting costs, but to a lot of people in the industry, Joyce was a very good fireman CEO, keeping the airline on its feet through really tough periods like the financial crisis and later also through the early stages of the pandemic. An example of how he acted was when Joyce in March 2020 announced that he would give up his salary for the next few months, which he also did and he only started getting his base salary back in August that same year. But to put that in perspective, the airline also had to furlough or fire thousands of employees during that COVID crisis in order to stay afloat. Now, many airlines around the world were making similar moves at that time, but Qantas soon started attracting some unusual complaints. In particular, when thousands of flights were inevitably cancelled during the pandemic, the airline started giving people travel vouchers instead of the refunds that many travelers felt that they were entitled to. Again, that wasn't an unusual move among airlines in 2020 and 2021 due to the sheer volume of border closures and cancellations, but the travel vouchers that Qantas issued had expiry dates so short that they would expire before those travel restrictions had been lifted. Because of this, Qantas soon faced a class action lawsuit and later removed those expiry dates but they only did that last summer in 2023 for flights between January of 2020 and November of 2022. Now, if that was all that Qantas did, maybe this wouldn't have been much of a story, but it turns out that this was only the beginning. As borders finally started to reopen, many Australians complained that the ticket prices with Qantas now seemed very high, almost double what they had been in 2019 before the pandemic. And in October of 2022, an explanation for this came from a very unexpected source, the then Qatar Airways CEO Akbar al -Bakir. You see, al -Bakir, who has since retired but wasn't a stranger to controversy himself, pointed out that Qantas still flew only about 50% of its pre-pandemic flights. And that was at a time when people who had been stuck at home for two years finally got the chance to go somewhere. Now remember, a big reason why Australians were loyal to Qantas in the first place was because they wanted the safety of having their own carrier who could offer plenty of affordable seats to their desired destinations. So this 
super slow ramp up with higher prices was not what many Australians was expecting from Qantas. In other parts of the world, airlines with good finances were using this early recovery period to get a leg up on their competitors by adding more routes, breaking into new markets and trying to steal their competitors' customers away with lower prices. But not Qantas. Now, normally, if an airline doesn't want to fly much, other airlines will swoop in and do that instead. And that was exactly what Qatar had wanted to do here. Until 2022, Qatar had flown into Australian cities 28 times per week, and they had now applied for 21 additional weekly flights. But that application was rejected in July of 2023. As it turns out, Qantas had written to the Australian government opposing Qatar's application, since, in their words, it would distort the market. But the funny thing here was that other airlines in that same market, like Virgin Australia, didn't agree at all and actually supported Qatar's position. There is little doubt that Qatar's added flights would have driven down ticket prices, but Australia's government simply refused, stating that this would hurt Australian enterprises. Like Qantas. Now, this was of course classic protectionism, and even before this happened there had been a lot of complaints that over the years politicians belonging to different political parties had often been a bit too accommodating to Qantas in ways that didn't always seem to benefit the public. Now all of this followed the publications of another move Qantas had made back in 2020. You see, Qantas had then fired 1,700 baggage handlers, citing the pandemic as the reason for doing so, but they then ended up outsourcing these job positions instead of rehiring those same people, in part because they wanted to weaken the union these workers were belonging to. Now, since then, a court has decided that Qantas fired these workers illegally, so they will have to sort that out somehow, but it really didn't look very good when this story came out. In fact, most of these stories that I've now told you broke within a few weeks of each other last summer in 2023. And as those storms were raging, another story made it clear that all of this had been happening at the same time as Qantas was making record profits. In 2023, the company earned 2.47 billion Australian dollars. That's about 1.6 billion US dollars. And that, of course, led to generous bonuses being handed out to the airline's executives, including the then CEO Alan Joyce. And if that wasn't enough, the airline also spent another 500 million Australian dollars in share buybacks, bolstering the share price for its investors. And that put all of those other stories into a disturbing perspective. You see, refusing ticket refunds, keeping prices high, protecting the airline from competition, slashing and outsourcing jobs, all of that might have been possible to explain, or excuse at least, if the airline was up against the ropes financially, but no, it was actually doing better than it ever had. To add insult to injury here, Qantas had also been receiving state support during the pandemic, adding up to around 2.7 billion Australian dollars. And Unlike some of the other national carriers who got state aid and then gradually returned it, Qantas stated that they didn't intend to pay any of that money back at all. Then, on the 29th of August last year, with people in Australia still trying to process many of these other stories, came what was to many in the country the straw that broke the camel's back. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, or ACCC, launched a court action against Qantas because the airline had been advertising tickets for thousands of flights that, in reality, they had already cancelled between May and July of 2022. Now, sometimes there might be a short delay between flight cancellations and a website getting updated with the correct information, but that's not what we're talking about here. The ACCC found that Qantas kept selling tickets for at least 8,000 flights for an average of more than two weeks, and in some cases up to 47 days after they had actually cancelled them, likely knowing full well that people were now paying for flights that they were not going to be able to fly. And even worse, Qantas then took on average 18 days, in some cases up to 47 days, to notify the existing passengers of those over 10,000 flights that these flights had actually been cancelled. Now, these cancellations didn't have anything to do with bad weather or other circumstances beyond the airline's control. Instead, it seems that they were instead done by purely operational reasons. 
Now you would think that after such a chain of embarrassing stories, Qantas and its management would be apologetic and remorseful, but no, they weren't, at least not to begin with. Instead, on the day that the ACCC announced its suit, Qantas was quick to respond, saying that they would happily make its case in the courts. And the interesting thing was that the airline didn't really try to deny what had happened. Instead, they simply put it down to disruptions of the pandemic. Although, again, this actually happened well later, when Australia had opened its borders in May and June of 2022. In the days that followed, reactions to what Qantas did completely snowballed, and the company's management soon realized the scale of the new public relations disaster. Previously, Alan Joyce had planned to retire from his post as CEO in November, the 15th anniversary of when he took up that position in 2008. But now he ended up actually leaving two months earlier, in September instead, leaving the company to face three separate legal challenges. The expiring travel vouchers, the outsourced baggage handlers' jobs and the sale of cancelled tickets. CEO Alan Joyce fast-tracking his retirement effective immediately amid growing pressure. Obviously, almost immediately after he left, people started asking, should Alan Joyce actually be allowed to get his planned exit payout after all of what had happened? Including bonuses, his goodbye gift would originally have been 21 million Australian dollars, or around 14 million US dollars. And that's a lot of money no matter how you turn it. It was later finally announced that Joyce would get less than half of that amount, 9.26 million Australian dollars instead, and he was then replaced in the CEO chair by the company's then chief financial officer, Vanessa Hudson, who has since apologized for the company's actions. Initially, the ACCC said that it would seek a record penalty of 250 million Australian dollars for the cancelled tickets that the airline had sold. And this would double the biggest ever fine given out to a corporation in Australia. But in the end, Qantas and the ACCC ended up settling out of court. As part of that agreement, the airline ended up having to pay 120 million Australian dollars, about 79 million US dollars for this last fiasco. But out of that money, 100 million dollars was the fine itself, and only 20 million went to the affected customers, all 86,000 of them. That's 232 Australian dollars and 56 cents per person on average. Now, Qantas today operates over 60% of all domestic flights in Australia, and on top of everything else, its late flight cancellations and protectionisms it enjoyed has led to a scarcity of available slots at key airports, which may have contributed to the financial struggles of other small Australian airlines and startups. The motto of Qantas is the spirit of Australia. But in the eyes of many Australians, their national carrier have now gone from an icon of national identity and pride to a disgrace, all in the space of a few weeks. Now I'm sure Qantas will do fine in the future. Their latest financial results are a little bit gloomier, but given how they have behaved, they should have some extra resources tucked away. So the real question is, will the Australians end up forgiving their national carrier? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below and also let me know if there's any other airline controversies that you think that I should be covering on this channel. Now, as I'm filming this, I'm also getting ready to host an awesome Zoom hangout with my Patreon crew and I hope that I will be able to see you there next time. Check out the link in the uh, description below if you're interested and you can also buy some cool merch there or check out my sponsor. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.